Hey, Liam. Hey, Calvin. How are you today, bud? Good. Fighting a cold, but other than that. Yeah. Well, I hope you had a great uh, Thanksgiving. Yeah. How, how was yours? Oh, it was wonderful. You know, some uh, coming out of KubeCon, I got some nice downtime. Um, um, uh, uh, your audio cut out. Uh, can you hear, still hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I got yeah, you. My apologies. Yeah, I'm just trying to get some lunch ready, so I'll just be on mute listening in for the first part of the meeting. Bailey's on the community stream, so I just logged in to make sure we had some coverage today. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm going to hang out. Hey, everybody, how's it going? Doing all right. The uh, you got the new mustache. <laughs> <laughs> Took a page out of the Danny book. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Except mine is mine does it doesn't uh, isn't quite uh, well. You trimmed yours up. Uh, I, I was uh Steve Jobs for Halloween. Fancy. Uh, Halloween required that I shave my mustache, so uh. It's, uh <gasps> on its way back. I, I grew it back quickly because I'm actually renewing my driver's license tomorrow and I was like, I need the <laughs> for the, but yeah. Well, it's looking good, Danny. <laughs> Thanks, man. Hello. Hey, Brooks. Hey, folks. Good to see you. I think I've seen you in person more than virtually lately, which is a wild, uh, a wild world, world we live in, but good to see y'all. Cool. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's get it till about uh, five after, and uh, then we'll get kicked off. Hello. Joining from the hospital. There's a new little thingy. Congratulations. Thank you. Congrats. Oh, <laughs> amazing. So cute. <laughs> it was one yesterday. Congrats. Well, <laughs> <laughs> whatever will happen on this meeting, you start the show. <laughs> I really wanted to know what was going to happen in this meeting. <laughs> Do you have anybody that would like to uh, moderate the meeting? If there are no takers, I would be delighted to do it. I uh, just want to leave the space open for anybody that would be interested in getting involved uh, and you know experiencing moderating. I promise it's not hard and there will be no judgment. Fair enough. Um, anyone else who would like to volunteer to perhaps take notes? Preferably someone who is not speaking in the meeting. Yeah, I can, I can help with the presenting. notes today. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Okay, excellent. So give it one more minute. And uh, for our agenda, we look like we're going to chat about registries and OCI, and then hopefully uh, get an update uh, from Wasm Badge folks about uh, component model. Sounds like fun. <clears throat> All 
Okay, as far as I know, we are five minutes past the hour, so I will kick us off. Uh, hello, my name is David Justice. You are at uh, Tag Runtime's WebAssembly Working Group. Uh, we are a CNCF uh, uh, group. Uh, we abide by the CNCF Code of Conduct. Um, generally, that just means be nice to each other, be kind, and uh, we try to raise our hands in the meetings. So if you'd like to be recognized, uh, if you raise your hand, you will be recognized. Um, I don't believe I have any PSAs to speak of today. So without further ado, let's jump right into the agenda. So for today, uh, we are going to talk about registries um, and we're gonna get an update about uh, the happenings in WARG. And WARG is our WebAssembly uh, registry and Calvin and Danny are here to chat about that. So uh, Calvin, Danny, would you like to uh, take the floor? Sure. So. Um... I, just so you know, I, I'm fighting a little bit of a cold, so um, you know, excuse if I cough a little bit. I'll try to mute. Um, uh, so let me let me share my screen. I prepared a just a couple slides, um, just as talking points. So, uh, Warg is WebAssembly Registry, and it's a Bytecode Alliance project, and it's an open source protocol. It's not a service designed for publishing and fetching WebAssembly binary packages. So explicitly binaries. Uh, so for instance, you know, if you're dealing with WIT, that has a text format, it has to be compiled to the binary to be published. There's some design decisions on um, how work operates. Um, it's, it's designed for libraries, uh, WebAssembly libraries and interfaces like WIT, as well as development or uh, deployment artifacts that can be published um, and it's federated. So there's there's not, a, it, the design is not for a single org server to exist, but rather um, any number of them, you can run your own and it, making it easy for you to mirror other registries and import packages from them. Uh, uh, the kind of the one way to think about this is you can publish uh, packages that depend upon packages in other registries, um, as well as um, uh, be able to mirror uh, other registries and act on, uh, respond as if you were another registry as part of the protocol. So for like caching purposes and replication, et cetera. Um, and work builds on, work is not, um, it's focused on building on top of existing services like blob stores and OCI registries. So in some ways we can talk through some of this maybe later on, but um, you can use OCI as a backend for where the content actually lives and work can sit in front of it. But it's still probably not what you expect. Um, when uh, Danny and I uh, joined this project, um, uh, roughly six months ago, and I should acknowledge uh, the other primary contributors to this project, uh, Lan Martin, Kyle Brown, and Peter Hewn. And um, what we were, what we found is like the architecture was relatively built out, and it was difficult to wrap our heads around because, uh, for instance, like package names are not available <laughs> by default. Uh, it's there's a lot of like quirky things that just seem so weird at first glance. But if you actually dig into the details of the trade-offs and the design decisions, there was some reasoning and careful thought around it. And uh, they're slowly moving toward uh, solving some of these uh, things that you would expect to exist in the protocol are increasingly becoming more available. But the core functionality was uh, focused on what I would say verifiable logs. And this is a key part of um, uh, the considerations of the design of it. And what this is around is um, uh, being able to detect a registry that is lying to you. So for instance, it, in the world of uh, software supply chain issues, um, how in, especially in a federated world where you're, in, you're um, pulling packages from other registry servers that uh, you may not necessarily trust, um, how do you protect yourself at least from some of these basic things of 
a registry lying to you and saying uh, that a package that uh, was compromised uh, is the one to use or um, skipping over versions um, or um, uh, not presenting, presenting the most recent version. Um, and it's like, for instance, uh, things could be yanked. So things pulled. So the entire protocol is designed around uh, the clients, anybody that interacts with the registry, the CLI clients or registry to registry communication uh, needs to be able to verify that uh, and check that the registry state is uh, uncompromised. And there's some complexities there, but, and I, I'd like to step through a couple of those details here after these slides. Uh, and feel free, uh, by the way, feel free to interject and ask questions at any time here. I, I didn't super prepare for you know this presentation, so it's it's a little more ad hoc and it's totally casual. So if you guys have any questions, just feel free to interject at any time. But uh, all of the logs are append only immutable. So if you want to yank something, it's adding a record uh, to the logs. Um, so there's no delete. Um, and there's due to the nature of these verifiable logs, if you wanted to delist a package, let's say due to copyright or whatever, um, you, you, you don't want the name embedded in the log systems so that the, you need all these record, you need all these um, data structures so that uh, all the verifiability doesn't get destroyed. So that's the reason why some of these, like I alluded to, package names weren't immediately available in this is because they are actually hashed. And um, I'll go through some of the recent developments around this, but um, that's kind of the basics of it. Um, open source development on this project is really kind of proceeding in three different ways. One is there's a reference server that is being built out, um, a Rust-based Postgres server, um, and it's it's kind of minimal. It it it's not really designed for high scalable usage or like fully featured. Um, it's it's designed almost as um, a test case, um, but it can be run in production um, with some caveats. And uh, there, we're also under development of uh, Work CLI and some Rust libraries that you can use to embed the, effectively the protocol logic into another CLI tool or some other, you know, piece of uh, tooling that you want to use. And since this is a Bytecode Alliance project, uh, all of the um, well, uh, many of the other projects that exist in the Bytecode Alliance have some desire to have registry integration. And so like, for instance, like Cargo Component or some of these other tooling, um, being able to uh, interact uh, and configure these tooling like it was uh, interacting with a work registry, um, these Rust libraries you know, are used as um, uh, dependencies in, in some of these other projects so that it gets you know, the full integration. So that this is a first class uh, consideration is making it easy for you to embed this logic in something else. Um, and also we're, we're working on a protocol specification. It, it doesn't exist in its uh, documentation form yet, uh, but we're working our way through it. Um, the best example, the, the best um, piece of documentation we have right now around the protocol is an open API spec. And um, I was gonna uh, share just a couple pieces around that for you guys. Um, let's see, you guys can see this screen. Is this, oh, I'll zoom in. So um, let me just go through a couple conceptual things um, and then you guys feel free to ask questions at any time. But there's this notion of a checkpoint that represents the entire registry state at any one point in time. Um, and there's, uh, if you wanted to like, for instance, ask somebody else, like if everything in the registry was correct, you could just say, verify this checkpoint. Um, and this is kind of important for some of these other, you know, federated use cases where you're uh, mirroring something else and caching it. You can actually ask the source relatively cheaply, or is this the correct answer? 
uh, through that you're receiving through some other third party. And um, there's the, also all the API design uh, endpoints are you providing essentially uh, what uh, checkpoint you are asking about. So um, if you are querying for the state of the registry or getting latest packages, you're asking about it at the state and time of a particular checkpoint. Um, and uh, so for instance, uh, when you are querying and trying to get package logs, which are a series of um, uh, base 64 encoded <laughs> protobufs um, where they are signed. Um, and this is kind of a, uh, you know, an API kind of example here, but um, essentially the data in the protobuf is like what release version and the hash digest of the package. So uh, when you're actually referring to the content, you can verify um, that you're getting the correct thing when you go to download it and compare the hash. Um, and the uh, release, uh, all the releases in the package log are um, uh, point to the previous record. So you're, if any of the, if you try to interject anything, it, it just, it fails verification. Uh, now, like a, an interesting new API that just, just got, is you can actually get the, uh, you refer to packages by their log ID, which is the hash. Now there's an API endpoint where you can say, give me the package name from a log ID. This, this whole like API design is not um, necessarily designed from a perspective of a, a really usable developer experience. It's all designed around forcing you to validate everything. Um, this is a, probably a better way to think about it. And from publishing packages, you're, you're, there's a, a number of different mechanisms, but you can easily integrate on the server side back to an OCI store where you're actually putting the content store. So one way to think of Warg is it's something that could sit in front of where you're actually storing the data. And everything is designed around, um, you would provide URLs that can exist, uh, like upload URLs that can exist on a separate server, right? So um, it, it's designed in a way that you're not tied to any particular uh, content storage layer. Um, right now, it's, it's mostly kind of set up for um, probably a blob store from a client's perspective. But the client, in theory, could talk directly to an OCI store, or the server uh, could broker that interaction itself, um, which is probably the simplest way due to the authentication with OCI and all that sort of stuff. Um, now, a, a lot of this stuff is designed around uh, how the component models import syntax supports um, you being able to import other implementations. Now, this hasn't made it all the way through all the tooling and the component model ecosystem yet. <laughs> but essentially, this is what you would think of as um, using libraries in a normal programming language, as opposed to uh, how a lot of components operate today, which is like an interface, which can be implemented by the host or another component. This is actually using uh, like a sember and like a, a a registry identifier saying, I want this other package, resolve this and put it in. So this is actually the library kind of like composition use case, which again, isn't, it, we're, we're working our way through all the tooling around this, but works kind of designed for this use case. Um, and then when you bundle and lock this stuff, then you would probably publish it to a registry and it could be used for, let's say deployment purposes as it's like fully locked. Uh, with all the uh, exact um, uh, resolved SEMBER uh, resolution of the different things. Uh, please, uh, I don't know who raised their hand first. David, do you want to uh, go? Just real quick, a uh, point of order. Uh, we are uh, nearing 20 minutes into this meeting, and there's three other, uh, ah, two so other talks. I'm going to wrap up, um, and uh, please, question, uh, Sabin. Uh, sorry, I, I forget I pronounced your name. Sorry. 
Oh, good. Uh, thank you. So initially you uh, mentioned that uh, it's an append-only registry, so you are just uh, adding new versions. Um, when you're running this for years, uh, is there a problem with the volume or depublishing things, or is it just neglectable because the artifacts aren't stored in the registry? Yeah, so th th this is multi-layered. So for for instance, if you let's say you want to uh, forget about things, you don't what you really need to not forget about is logs, right? So, and that's not a lot of data. Uh, the actual content bytes, you could still, let's say, provide the logs and all the verifiability aspects without deleting anything. But um, when someone actually tries to download those assets, that's separate. So you could just say not available. Uh before we like fully wrap up, we should uh, let people know that like they can get in touch with us. So we're on Zulip all the time. Uh, and there's also like a WARG topic in Zulip and then there's like weekly uh, WARG meetings and stuff. So uh, feel free to reach out to either me or Calvin or attend any of the meetings. Yeah, and uh, we, we did do one release last month and we're about to do another release probably next week, I'm hoping. Um, and it includes a lot of the federation and the mirroring stuff. And Danny and I are also independently working on a service so that you guys can use this without uh, having all the uh, suffering of setting up all this stuff for yourself. Um, and um, we look forward to sharing that in coming weeks. Hey, Danny and Calvin, uh, if you can uh, drop some links into uh, the agenda uh, doc, uh, give people some leads on where to get some more information. This stuff is is really awesome, but it's it's also very deep. So uh, you'll take a little bit of uh, diving in. And if there's any other content around work that you'd want people to see, um, please drop it in there. Uh, I'll definitely uh, make sure that uh, we disseminate that after the fact too. So uh, really appreciate you diving into to work and the ledger and the append only uh, nature of it. Um, it's really cool. I, I totally suggest you take a look at it, everybody, and uh, yeah, yeah, jump in. Uh, thank you. Uh, James, I think you're next up, uh, talking about OCI and WASM. Cool. Um, I'm going to share my screen as well. And I'll post the... Um, link to the stock here too. So if you want to peruse it on your own. Um, am I actually showing anything? Yeah, I see your doc. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to talk quickly about uh, WASM and OCI and where we're at and maybe some places we could potentially go. I'm really looking for feedback on some of this. Um, so just a little background. Um, I started working on uh, Container D's Run Wazi, uh, where we take OS, uh, WASM modules and components and then run them in a Kubernetes uh, in a Container D and Kubernetes uh, ecosystem. And uh, Jorge, if you'll feel free to speak up at any point if you want to add anything. Uh, he's yeah, cool. been doing a ton of work over there. <laughs> um, and uh, the the initial way that we took to approach uh, solving that problem was we took the WASM components, built them into a standard Docker container, and then we deployed the Docker container. Um, this works. Uh, I guess there's a few uh, caveats with that. Um, and one of the things that kind of came up, uh, some folks over at Spin and uh, Brian Goff also was thinking was that maybe we could package this as an OCI artifact of some sort, and uh, we won't have to have the container components. And there's a few benefits that come along with this potentially. Um, in particular, like WASM components are uh, cross-platform by design, and we were putting them into this platform-specific format, which means they can't run across various types of platforms. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other uh, ideas there. I there is an original design doc where I kind of came up with some a way to, to solve this problem, um, which has some of those details in there. Um, and so, um, one of the things, so so where we where we ended up landing was um, creating an OCI um, image that uh, contains custom WASM layers, 
Um, and I have an example of that over here. So um, to be able to leverage it and run it in a runtime, like spin outside container D and outside of Kubernetes, but also be able to run the same exact binary and same, same exact OCI um, component in, in, in Kubernetes, we, uh, we landed on this uh, layout here, which um, has a media type of the VND OCI image. Uh, and then with the, conf the config.media type, and this is the part that gets a little tricky, is we're de defining a uh, OCI image config format. Um, this has some of the information in it that needs that is needed for Kubernetes to be able, or container D or other runtimes to be able to convert into something that can run on those runtimes. Um, and, and then the individual layer here is we, we came up with a media type, um, which is still, you know, potentially discussable uh, around the, uh, like a component layer. And then this is just the component here. Um, and then this can be translated and run on, um, uh, run ind independently, like spin can pull something down and, and run it or, you know, a WASM cloud could potentially do something similar. Um, and then uh, we could also run the same exact thing over in the Kubernetes world. Um, and so uh, that's kind of where we're at now. Um, there's a lot of different various forms of this out there. Um, and uh, I think the biggest thing is the difference between the config media type and the, and the uh, layer media types. Um, and so I've linked a few things here around um, uh, examples of how, what these kind of look like right now. Um, we just looked at that one. This is the one that we're using in RunWazi as our kind of demo application that we test everything with. Um, but if we look over at spin, um, this was the initial spin v1 version. Uh, and this is similar to kind of how um, uh, WASM Cloud does it is they have their own media type here with their custom configuration inside um, inside the uh, config.media. Uh, and then they have their own layer types. Um, in spin v, spin v2, what we did was we uh, moved it to that OCI image config, and then we moved that application config down to another layer. And now they can run it, they can go spin up and the application launches, um, or they can take the same exact OCI component and then run it in Kubernetes. Uh, but you can see this media type isn't the, the Bitcode Alliance one that we were using in RunWazi. Uh, and then we also have this other media type over here. Um, and so, um, yeah, there's a lot of different components moving here. Uh, one of the feedbacks that we got when we were talking with the OCI um, group was that um, we initially had approached using it like an artifact, uh, like an OCI artifact, putting an artifact type on the top uh, layer. And um, because we were still using the media type of uh, image, uh, they, they wanted to distinguish between artifacts and images. And so um, we, there's no really great way to identify uh, a WASM OCI image with those WASM layers, except for looking at the layers at this point. Um, and so there's a few drawbacks to this, this initial approach, uh, although you can start to use it today. Um, it's not an artifact. Um, there's, you know, we're, we're using the um, image config, which has specific things to um, uh, container runtimes and not necessarily to uh, WASM runtimes. And so like you, you have to put in an entry point. Spin doesn't really have an entry point. Um, they have information in their config that matches this. And I, I believe that's the same for WASM cloud. Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah, they just they, like there's a little bit of a mismatch in some some fields. Some fields actually play really well. Some some don't. Um, uh, it doesn't have any WASM specific information. So in the um, container D, um, the so it, it, in Run Wazu we've identified a few areas where we don't have all the information coming across, and we need to be able to we, we need to get that somehow. Uh, and we haven't quite figured out how to how to solve those problems. Um, and then there's a few other other challenges um, uh, here. So 
what, what I'm proposing is that we would want to potentially solve this by creating a, a real WASM OCI artifact. Um, uh, and that means we would have an artifact type as well as um, a config type that is potentially translation uh, translatable to the... Sorry, what? James, can, can yep. I add a, a little bit before we move forward? Um, yeah, go ahead. So when, when you mention uh, platform specific things in the in the OCI that we use, um, I wanted to mention that the thing that's platform specific is in particular um, the file system layers. Uh, currently they are like tar images for Linux and for Windows they are VM images. Um, so they change between one platform and another. And um, that particular bit is like kind of Linux specific, at least the way it's currently handled. Handle it. Um, as far as I know, the rest is platform independent. And correct me if I, I'm wrong about that. Um, yes. The other yeah, thing. That's correct. Um, um, and so if you were going to attach any extra files or something, you, they, they wouldn't be platform, like the root file system wouldn't work across, uh, across those, yes. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that we were looking into, like, especially when we talk about moving to components, we were looking into the OCI uh, specification has a, an Arch and an OS uh, field, and, and the OS field has something that's not very used uh, uh, nowadays, which is the OS features that are required. And the idea would be the architecture is WASM32, the OS is WASI Preview 2, and then in the features, you could potentially specify the weight walls that your component requires the runtime to, to provide. That's something that uh, it's not, uh, there's, we haven't developed anything taking that into account, but something that we can potentially do in the future. Yeah, and and sp specifically on that point, there's also a um, OCI group that's a uh, working group that's happening right now trying to determine whether or not we should use something like os.features versus some sort of other compatibility um, definition. And so that that's another conversation that's happening at the same time. Over yeah, and schedules. then you were mentioning the, the spin case and in spin, um, we could imagine the entry point being the spin.toml file. So that's not currently how the shim is implemented, but that's an implementation detail. Um, but um, what I wanted to say that that configures the how spin works internally and i know that um there's some work into the wasi runtime config which is a width interface uh, that would be the intention is that that would be generic enough so that we could get rid of the spin.toml and that becomes another web assembly component that tells spin how to configure itself so that's something that um is being looked at as well um, and might simplify some of the things related to having different layers, um, being WASM layers or configuration layers or something like that. Uh, th th those, those were just my points before we, we move forward. You're muted, James. James, we can't hear you. I think we have five more minutes. Does anybody else have any quick questions before I kind of talk a little bit further? I, I think I'm going to touch upon a couple of things that Jorge was mentioning there too. Okay, cool. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I think, you know, having a WASM artifact with like an actual artifact type and an actual config.media type and inside that config media type would have some sort of, um, configuration that is specific to WASM. It's not specific to SPIN or WASM Cloud or any of those other things, but that has some some of those extra additional WASM um, configuration needed, configuration fields that are needed, as well as addition, a couple of the runtime things so that we can translate it from um, uh, container D, Kubernetes side, as well as a, um, you know, a, just outside of that world, because uh, we want to be able to kind of run these across both of uh, those worlds. Um, and um, yeah, so the other other few areas that potentially um, could could be solved here is, you know, tooling, um, is there potential to create like a Docker file type thing with build kit? 
um, that, that builds these, um, also integrating with WARG. Um, I know David did some work in that previously and we've, we've paused it momentarily, but we do have a kind of an example of like pushing the WARG. WARG uses the OCI as a backend, um, uh, OCI registry as a, as a backend, and then um, you can pull those uh, when, you're, when you're running in the, the Kubernetes world. Um, and then um, uh, speaking about different types of layer types, um, if everything is a component, um, then we could potentially have a single layer type instead of having all these different types and we don't have to know about all of those. Um, and then um, if, if we can move towards like an artifact type, then we could potentially improve some of the container uh, runtimes to be able to do some things like if you have an OCI um, artifact with four or five different modules in it, we could potentially pre-compose those or pre-compile them and get them ready for the runtime before the runtime goes. And so we get some speed improvements and some performance improvements there. Um, and yeah, so I'm super interested in uh, hearing what other people think here. Um, please yes. comment and take a look at the uh, Adam, Pushkar, Pushkar, come on. Oh, I don't think he's chatting with us. So I am. Uh, oh, yep. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I, there's a lot of details in here kind of going through all those. Um, please comment, give feedback. Um, and uh, yeah, David, go ahead. Hey, James, can you talk about like, what is that pre-compile? Like what, what WASM's, you got a WASM format. Why do you need to pre-compile that? Or why would you have to do any kind of like binding together or anything like that? What, like, what is that? What were you, what did you mean when you were talking about that? Yep, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Um, so the, uh, so I'm not, I don't know that I'm the right person to talk about exactly what happens in like WASM pre-compiling. Um, but in WASM time, there is an option to pre-compile and it does some uh, pre-initialization, getting the components ready to, to run. Uh, that usually happens when you kick the component off initially. So you can do that uh, upfront and then the, uh, when you go to run the container, or uh, sorry, the, the WASM component itself, then you don't have to do all that stuff. And so you start um, the, the exact details there, I, I'm not necessarily the exact uh, person to do that. But I know that WASM Edge and other things also have some of, um, some, some of those capabilities as well. That's awesome. So like when it goes to land on a machine that happens to be like ARM64 as opposed to AMD64 or you know, other things as well. So you can optimize it to be ready to run. Yes, that's what can happen in, in there. There's a, there's like, a, at least in WASM time, there's a dozen different flags that you can set. You can make it, uh, it looks like you can just set it to pre-compile it so that it will just do the initialization and still run on any architecture. And then you can also do some architecture specific um, initialization. Yeah, David, there's if you look at the, learning. if you look at the link to Wiser there, yes, sir. Go ahead. Oh no, I was saying that, that there's also a precompilation. Uh, there's a, a way to precompile using WasmH as well and generate machine code basically, so which I think is it's different like... to what Wiser does, right? Wiser is um, generating another Wasm file. Is this is wiser the type of pre initialization that you'd be talking about here in this example? Um, so it's like exactly snapshotted, ready to ready to play um, to sort of reduce the cold start time. Yeah. So I what I did was I took Wasm times uh, seal like, like in the CLI. There's like a pre compile step. I don't know if it's using wiser behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I essentially ran that. There's also like an API that you can go through. Uh, and then, and then yes, so that made that startup time significantly faster. Uh, maybe, maybe Wiser does something more advanced that would make it even faster. Uh, sorry, but um, Wiser basically takes a WebAssembly file and runs everything until there's something non-deterministic and generates another WebAssembly file, uh, which is not machine code, right? Then that needs to be converted to something that this whole CPU understands. Um, when we were talking about pre-compiling, at least, um, from the WASM Edge side, when you pre-compile, you're generating the machine code that corresponds to that WebAssembly file so that then you don't have to do to that that conversion again. 
and that lets you speed things up. Wiser uh, it takes a different approach and is like pre-executing things as much as possible and generating a new WebAssembly file. But then that WebAssembly file has to be converted again. Um, so I just a oh go ahead. You no, know, I was just gonna say, is this uh, effectively what we're talking about here? Is like ahead of time compiling, so that we can have essentially machine instructions that are non-portable or non-portable. Um, a non-portable compilation target? Yeah. Okay, thanks. And and so the I think those are all kind of implementation details. And so that, the idea here is that you publish your WASM components as you normally would. Um, but then when you go to pull them on a node, uh, container D can do all of that. They, it knows about the architecture that it's running on. And so it can do all that for you pre, like as a pre-initialization step so that when you go to run it or when you go to run the second or third or fourth instance of that, you don't have to do that every single time. Um, and so that's that's some of the things that I think we can solve by coming to like an OCI artifact um, uh, so solution here that works across the board for everybody. Um, are, are you thinking that would even be portable like across different nodes as well? Uh, no. So like the the thing that's portable would be the OCI artifact that we publish into the registry. Uh, okay. And then when you go and pull it, um, just like um, mm -hmm. we, we do today with like containers where we snapshot the, uh, or, or we kind of like lay out the file system. Instead of laying out the file system, we, we know the architecture, we know, um, all the things that it needs it needs to run. And so we can do that pre-compiling initially and then lay it out. And so then when something like run WASI goes to grab it, it can grab the, the pre-initialized, pre-compiled -pre uh, component. Gotcha, yeah. You just mentioned when it, it compile it once and then you can run it multiple instances, but all on the same node as opposed Correct. to like, yeah. Yeah. All right, hate to hate to interrupt uh, here, but uh, I, I really enjoyed the discussion. Uh, please let's let's keep this going in the Slack, um, and maybe have uh, uh, some more discussion about the the content of the document as well. Um, please give some feedback there. Uh, we um, do David, need to. Oh, yes. Sorry, just one more thing, James. Thanks for going yeah. over this. Where can we learn more, or where are these conversations happening? Uh, awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> go ahead. No, please go. Yeah, so um, I, I've been trying to drop these conversations into the WASM working group, as well as um, there's a couple of issues on the OCI repos uh, repository that are, have them. If you open up this document, you can leave comments. I've tried to link to everything that where everything is happening. <laughs> uh, so you can follow all the links and get there. Um, and then, um, yeah, let's continue in the, the Slack there. and. Um, really excited about hearing more feedback about all this. Thank you. Uh, awesome. Uh, very excited as well. <clears throat> um, let's see. Uh, Michael, uh, are you, I think you're in attendance. Um, um, yes, I'm. Would, would you like to, uh, would you be so kind as to, uh, you know, give us a little bit of chat about where WASM Edge is uh, with uh, component model support? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, let me share. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's so good to have you here. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Sorry, I missed the last meeting. Somehow I didn't get the meeting invite. But you know, uh, but we are here. So um, yeah. So um, well. So Wasm Edge has been um, working on component model support for um, for some time, and the work was, um, you, you know, because it depended dependent on the spec to be finalized. But I think it's now finally finalized. So you know, so I, so uh, let me give a quick overview of the steps that we have to take to get there. So the, uh, broadly speaking, there are three steps. So the first really is to um, implement the component model the new binary format in the component model, you know, because the component model introduced uh, something other than the um, the WASM binary. It's called the component model binary. 
and uh, um, we'll have to support that binary format in our parser and also in our AOT toolchain and you know things like that in order to um, in order to have the language level support for component model. And uh, the idea is once we have that, we would move on to implement the uh, the actual WASI proposals that are dependent on the component models. For instance, almost all previous two uh, proposals now have um, requirements for say, things like resource types and you know things like that. And those are new uh, binary formats that we have to uh, that we have to support. So you know so so um, basically we have the uh, the 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 uh, the bi support the binary format first, and then uh, support those WASI proposals uh, specifically um, um, uh, for preview too. And uh, then after that, um, uh, the things that are specific to Wasm Edge, that Wasm Edge has a has a large um, 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 plugin ecosystem. The plugins, um, those are essentially packaged uh, host functions that uh, um, that could be made to to be compatible with component models. To just to uh, give you some examples, you know, so for instance, our uh, different backends for Wasm uh, like the, our uh, PyTorch backend or our um, GGML background or TensorFlow background and backend, those are all implemented as um, as uh, as Wasm Edge plugins and also uh, streaming data processing around those AI models. For instance, we have a, a Open AI uh, no Open CV plugin, and we have a FFmpeg plugin, and we also have things um, that are more standardized like the Wasi Crypto proposal, and uh, um, you know things of that nature. So so you know so uh, those are. Uh, today we have a uh, we have an interface that defined within um, uh, within Wasm Edge to interact with those uh, with those host functions, and uh, uh, we would also like to um, make them compatible with component model after we are done with the with the um, with the immediate need, which is uh, to implement those um, those um, uh, Wasi uh, preview two proposals. Um, so, however, you know. Um, a challenge that we have uh, that we have found is that um, we uh, we pretty much cannot do this linearly because um, because the um, the binary format the component model binary format is still evolving. You know, as I understand, you know, there's uh, uh, we are still adding things to it. You know, things like uh, asynchronous um, and you know things like that. So you know, um, I think it would be a, a a moving target to chase. <laughs> you know, you know, it would be a. a, a It'd be a long time, you know, if we if we do it um, to have the binary format first and then preview proposals and then was made plugins, it could uh, um, you, you, you know the time could drag on for a long time. So we have um, um, you know um, I think about a month ago we have decided to take perhaps a, a slightly different approach is to use um, the final deliverable to drive what we need to implement early in the pipelines. For instance, you know, what are the uh, subset of um, component model binary that uh, act that's the preview tool actually depends on? And then uh, start from there. And then, you know, um, to identify those subsets and then implement those, um, those, um, um, those um, the language parsers and, you know, things like that in the, in the uh, you know, around time. So we started that work. And uh, it's mostly tracked on this. Uh, if you can see that, uh, it mostly tracked on this issue, and you can probably, you know, um, so um, you know, see our progress here. And perhaps more specifically, because um, you know, there's um, there's a couple of events that's happen um, uh, early next year, uh, in spring next year. So uh, very specifically on Wasmio and also um, on, on KubeCon EU as well. Uh, and, and we do want to have some uh, some sort of um, component model support that we can demonstrate in those events. So we uh, we further further narrow down our um, our our scope to uh, very specifically, um, you know, um, you know, this component, right? You know, so that's uh, um, uh, depend on what the uh, HTTP. Uh, it's uh, it's use uh, uh, some subset of the features, but uh, um, so we are working our way backwards from the um, from the. Um, the early demonstration that we need to do to the um, you know um, early in the pipeline, you know what are the features that we want to, uh, that we need to implement, right? You know, uh, so one of the things that um, um, you know I'm really um, not wanting to do is to um, you know have a have a very large project that takes a year or two, and then you know um, have something released all at once. So you know I I I think with this approach, it's uh, you know it'll be possible for us to 
uh, release something a little earlier and uh, then you know uh, get uh, get community feedback while still um, um you know that's um, so once we have that we can um we can go back to push all the uh, preview to um, um, um proposals and then have um have all the um you know um component model binary format um um features needed for those proposals right and then go on to preview three and you know things like that so that's the general process and uh um in terms of timelines you know that's uh, um um because of most of our developers are uh, based in asia so um their um their holiday season actually start after january 1st so you know so um so i um so i'm hoping we will get some uh, significant amount of work done um you know um um this month and uh and uh um the work may slow a little you know that's um you know uh, when the when the holidays is starting asia but um you know but that's the general idea and hopefully we have something to for show to show for in march um next year so to have a to have a fully featured component that's was able to run but you know um but still have um you know um um missing holes that we have to plug you know in a, in a in a component model binary and also in in, in a real um you know um, preview two proposals yeah so that's that's the basic um update you know that's uh um so um i don't know if you guys have questions yeah That is a huge chunk of work, Michael, and this is super exciting to see. Um, very, very cool. Um, any any questions out there? Uh, I'm sure folks have, you got to have questions about this stuff. Um, so this is a big change, and uh, clearly WASMEDGE is a large project. Uh, the approach to this uh, is going to take some time, and there's complexities. I'll start off. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I know I have nothing to show you... at this moment. It's just roadmap, but you know, <laughs> we all have to. <laughs> and in the chat, everybody's blowing it up. Like you, you know, you always come in with great demos, and you didn't come with a demo. So, uh, you know, there's <laughs> folks in the chat that are probably going to be disappointed. But uh, so, in, in doing this, you are, you know, this, you know, the second runtime really to start. You know, really building component model support, right? Is that is that correct? Yeah, you know, so because um, you know, we look at um, you know, because certain things in the component model changes over time, and uh, we aren't um, you know, I think things really um started to um, um moving forward when I had a, a in person meeting with Luke, you know, so because um because before that it has always been you know all oh, this changed in in bottom time uh, and it did wasn't documented and you know so we have so you know that's so yeah that's uh um it has been a uh, you know difficult process in the past but I think it's getting a lot better um you know um uh, since we um since we had a uh, we improved communication so yeah. Awesome. Uh, I'm sorry, Luke, please. Yeah, I think you're totally right. It was churning a lot. And so that this is the primary motivation for this preview two stabilization point. But I will say that even transitioning from preview two to preview three, our goal is not to break any component binaries that were valid in preview two, but only to add extra types, uh, extra async support. So WASI interfaces will have a major version release, which is incompatible that uses these new features, but you can continue to support the preview two versions of WASI interfaces and preview two component binaries won't cease to be, be they won't stop being valid. So it, it is a good time to, uh, to, uh, to, to implement the the full, you know, the binary format. And WASI HTTP uses probably like 95% of the component model preview two. A lot of preview two is shaped around, <laughs> like, let's get WASI HTTP like working um, as best we can in a preview two timeframe. So um, yeah, good, good I, that makes total sense uh, what you said earlier, uh, going straight at WASI HTTP. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, you know, how developers think, you know, that's, uh, um, you know, um, ask them to do, um, you know, um, a support component model, you know, that's a very uh, big target. So they, they look at the binary format first and they see, you know, they have to chase for the other changes, but then, you know, we have to review and they understand, you know, that you don't have to chase all those changes. You have to work backwards. You, you know, so it's, uh, <laughs> so it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a, a learning process from us as well, because, 
when we uh, when we implemented uh, you know um, a wasm itself, you know the, the standard was very stable at the time. You know there's multiple implementations out there already. So you know so it was uh, um, you know uh, we can just read the documents and 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 then implement that. But now it's uh, you know so it's a uh, it's a it's a learning process for us as well. You know we appreciate your help. Yeah, so makes total sense. Luke, can I ask you to elaborate a little bit on the ABI stability um, and the target for ABI stability? When, when, what is that? Why is that significant? When is that coming up? Yeah, so this this preview to milestone, which we're right about at, you know, we're hopefully, you know, this week or in two weeks, we'll be having a vote that more or less says, all right, we're going to declare preview to stable. That means that a component model, it covers like, uh, the preview to, you know, what's in the component model repo basically now, you know, what's the components and what's the binary encoding of one. And then a, a subset of the different WASI proposals, we stamp a precise version and say, you know, this particular width, this is, you know, 0 0.2 of, of, of this, of the WASI HP proposal and the, you know, the, uh, the CLI proposal and, and, and other supporting ones. So we want to keep those working while growing the subset of uh, of set of things that work. So those the, the ideas those will, will won't stop working for a long time. And in the preview three time frame, we won't break com uh, component change the component model binary format. And while there would be new major versions of different WASI interfaces that take advantage of the new features available in preview three, we would provide adapters that can automatically take a preview two speaking component and adapt it to speak preview three uh, interfaces. So uh, lots of support for kind of automatically transitioning preview two stuff into preview three. So um, yeah, we, we want people to be able to write stuff now and have it work for a long, long time. Um, yeah, I don't know if you do any, any more specific uh, points you were thinking about that we didn't cover. No, that, that's perfect. Uh, thank you, Luke, I appreciate it. Uh, any, any questions for uh, Michael or, or Luke folks? Everybody already tired, it's been an hour. Okay, um, if there are no more, uh, then I will continue. And uh, Michael, I wanna say thank you so much for coming in and talking about this. Um, you, you give a very uh, uh, unique perspective on, on stuff that uh, is going on in the ecosystem right now. So thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm sure everybody else does as well. Um, thank you for all the other presenters. Uh, there is a document from last week that are that's in the agenda notes about um, ideas for um, platform engineering and how WebAssembly and component models apply to platform engineering. Um, please consider taking a look at it. Um, if you have any ideas and you'd like to uh, add them there, please do. Uh, we're also looking at... Uh, we're going to start putting together white papers, um, proposals for uh, perhaps less than specifications, but more than uh, more than like hand wavy stuff. It's it's more guidance on like say uh, OCI images. We should be doing them like this. They should have this kind of structure. Uh, they should work with these kind of runtimes and start to provide this guidance. Uh, and structure uh, so that others in the ecosystem can you know take advantage of this knowledge. Uh, I think James's document is a, a good start down that path, but I think we also need to describe everything from here's the registry, here's here's a component being made on on some of these system to registry to backend to composition to running inside of a cluster and and start to describe these and put together you know good documentation so people can move forward from these. Um, if, if folks are interested in that, please, uh, love involvement and more contribution, the better. Um, and if anybody has any questions about getting involved there, please find us in the WG WASM Slack channel and, uh, drop, drop a note and let's go to town. All right. Well, any, any, uh, any PSAs, anybody have anything to cover? It wasn't mentioned uh, WASM Day submissions are due in just a couple of days. Uh, so it's only a half day event this year. So we've only, we're only going to have six or maybe eight slots, depending on how we break up the content. Maybe we could do offer um, us more sessions um, just for the last time. But we're somewhat constrained on both facilities this year. 
We're also still looking for sponsors for Wasm Day if um, anyone's interested. Thank you, Liam. Get those proposals in there, folks. Let's go. Any other PSAs? You did an awesome job on the meeting today, David. Coming from you, I, I truly, truly appreciate that. You are the uh, uh, awesome. master of ceremonies. I don't know. Not Brooks. Brooks has that man on our team now. I'm just, just a, you know, I just do, do what I do. What is that? <laughs> well, I thank you all. Uh, thank you all for coming. And I hope you have a wonderful Tuesday. Cheers, y'all.